Hey everyone, welcome to this very bright room, but uh, this stream. I'm going to just firstly say any questions and answers will have to be done through the app or come and see me if you're having troubles with the app. I'll be up here in the front corner because we have a hybrid stream happening you know, this year, so we've got to include all the people who aren't here physically present in the room. So on that note, um, I will introduce Richard Stocks uh, from Recorded Futures. He's an experienced professional, been in, in the industry for decades on both sides of the vendor-client sort of relationship. Um, he's comfortable dealing with everyone from the C-suite and the board down to all the projects. And he shares a love of uh, capturing light in the form of photography with myself. So we both enjoy that kind of thing. Without further ado, come on up, Richard, and he'll be talking through better living through security intelligence. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Oh, it was applause from next door. I thought you had some canned ones that you piped through. I was going to get excited for a second. Thanks for joining everyone this morning. I um, hope you're uh, all enjoying the conference so far. Um, wow, those lights are really bright and I can't actually see anyone because you're all so far back in the room. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about how security intelligence can help make life easier for everyone. And I think, next slide, there we go. Um, range issues on the clicker maybe. Um, one of the questions that we really get so actually, let me back up a bit. Um, so my role with Recorded Future is I'm an intelligence specialist. I'm not an intelligence analyst. I'm not the guy that's there writing reports. Um, but my role is to work with our clients and prospects to understand their use cases for intelligence and really help them get their goals and how, that, how what we do can help them in their day-to-day -day, day -day roles. So one of the, well, two of the questions we get asked most often, how can I make my team more efficient and how can I reduce risk to my business? Um, I think. Everyone in the room has probably been asked to do more with less, particularly in the current age. Um, hiring analysts is expensive, hiring SOC operators is expensive and very difficult to do. The answer in a lot of cases is automation. We're gonna automate everything in our environment. Um, and that's a great goal. And it's you know, the, the context of the conference, soaring into cyber. Um, the problem is you can't soar without security intelligence, really. You can't automate something if you don't know what it is you're making a decision on. And a lot of SOAR, um, I don't know if we've got any SOAR vendors in the room, I'm friends with a lot of them, um, and this isn't anything about SOAR products, it's just, you know, if you don't have a trigger, how do you automate something? And a lot of those triggers are actually manual. So maybe the better question is, how can I use intelligence to make my team more efficient and use intelligence to reduce risk to my business? And you know, the beautiful thing here is intelligence leads to automation. Right? So once you have that intelligence in place and feeding into your tool sets and available to your analysts, then you can really start automating things to that next level. And the life cycle of that is you're starting with raw data. And I guess you know, some form of seam tool, log management tool is reasonably common in a lot of environments now. It helps. You've got your logs in one place. You've got a query interface over the top of it but finding what you're looking for is still a manual task. Once you start bringing intelligence into that environment and working with enriched data, you can then complement the raw data with that and have those indicators available to you. You can start, instead of searching for an IP address, you can search for things that you know are bad. Right, it makes that threat hunting a lot easier. And once you've got the context, you can have tools make decisions for you. You can start actually automating things. So I'm trying to keep this fairly neutral. I, I may slip into some recorded future terms, I apologise. Um, from our point of view, we really see six main use, use cases for Intel in, in the enterprise world, uh, which we break down into brand protection, geopolitical, security operations, third party threat hunting and vulnerability Intel. And these lend themselves to automation in different ways and, and to different levels. Geopolitical intelligence we really see as location-based monitoring of physical threats. This could be to your people, to your assets, cities, whatever it happens to be. By its nature, it's very human-centric. Um, there's not a lot you can really automate in this. We've seen some people do things like look at locations and then automatically send alerts to check up on people to make sure their staff are okay. Um, but there's usually, you know, by its nature, it's, it's usually a very human-centric thing. There's not a lot of automation opportunity within Geopol. Similar with threat hunting, um, and this is possibly a little bit counterintuitive. Um, if threat hunting, again, by its nature, is an interactive process, you are investigating a breach. You may use automation on uh, some automation tool sets 
to retrieve data for you, but in terms of an end-to-end -end automated without needing to think about things and, and have things done automatically for me, not really so much from that point of view. But where we get interest in, into some interesting automation possibilities is things say uh, brand intelligence. And again, that's kind of our term. Um, it's really looking at your, it, protecting your assets and looking to you know, how, how you defend against threats to your brand, your products, your employees, your executives, anything to do with your organization. And we kind of lump that into what we call brand intelligence. Um, so a couple of examples there. So things like fake domains. Um, there's a couple of different ways these surface. It could be a phishing attack. It could be someone posing um, from a, I'm pretending to be you and do some business email compromise. And we can use some intelligence sources like domain registrations and certificate registrations. Um, there's a, a usually a fairly defined path that these things happen. So you'll see a type of squat domain be registered. You'll see some DNS records stood up for that. You'll see a certificate registration because you can get SSL for free and everybody likes to be SSL these days. Um, it's, it's a very defined process. So if you're pulling that data in, you can start looking at you know, making a list, but then somebody still needs to review that. So if we do some further enrichment on that, so we can pull data in from DNS, we can compare to known bad hosts, for example. Um, it could be known phishing hosts, could be distributing malware, could be command and control servers. You can then start shortlisting what the people need to do. Now, again, with this type of thing, you're not going to get an automated end-to-end -end resolution, but you can do that first level of triage and filter out the noise. More importantly, you can look at that over time. So if you've got a list of domains that have been registered and you may not have enough information to request a takedown today, like if someone's just registered a name, it's, it's iffy whether you could get a takedown on that. But if then a command and control server is stood up on that or a phishing host is stood up on that, then it's a lot easier to do that, that takedown process. So by continually refreshing that data you have about those domains, you can then automate that. It pops up on someone's desk, investigate this, request takedown. Which brings me to Stocksy's first rule of security intelligence. Type of squats plus intel means less work. You're going to see a theme. I like less work. So the other side is credential leaks. Uh, this is another common risk that's lumped under uh, brand intelligence. And really, it's looking at any, dis any compromise that will lead to data theft, malware being installed, data disclosure. Um, you will see lots of data dumps containing people's credentials. You see lots of mentions on dark web and special access forums and marketplaces. And again, there's a very common life cycle on this. So the people that get access to your environment generally aren't the same people that will go and steal your data and install ransomware and that kind of thing. Um, you, you typically see an initial access broker has credentials to a VPN server or RDP host, whatever it happens to be, and they will sell that to someone usually for not very much money, which is kind of depressing. Um, and they'll install that to someone and they will come in and they will steal your data and then try to extort money out of you. Um, no, so no shortage of credential lumps. They often contain old data. Um, we see this trend now of multiple of people taking multiple data dumps and lumping them together and then releasing it and saying, oh, look at this new dump of data I've got. It's got 5 million records. And then somebody gets that and adds more to it and says, I've got 10 million records. Um, there seems to be this real try to one-up each other. And the problem is we're seeing data being recycled all the time. So when you get these credential leaks, like you have to investigate this stuff. So how can we reduce the workload on the investigation? Well, an easy first step to automate the triage on that is you've got a list of credentials, you know, you've got a list of email addresses. Start comparing those to active accounts. If they're not active accounts in your environment, you can ignore it. It's not a threat to you. Um, if it is an active account, create a service desk ticket, right? So someone can follow up with that user, walk through a password reset, whatever the, your internal process for that happens to be. Again, so you've gone from, you know, daily, we, we are literally seeing thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of credentials being cycled around on the dark web. If you have to manually sort through those and find, find things, you're never going to get any work done. If you want to get a little bit more comprehensive, if you've got some solid SIEM tools on the back end, Start looking for unusual logins that correlate to those usernames. Once so again, you can automate this process. If you find a match, if you see a login for a user that you've seen that credential in a data breach, and then you suddenly see a login from Kazakhstan for that user, right, lock the account. Right, you can do this automatically. Terminate the session, get rid of them. Then start looking for persistence in the environment. So again, go through your internal tools, start looking at what hosts that user's been touching. If you're feeling really brave, I don't know what's actually done that, 
If you've, got, if you've actually taken the time to set up good password reset and self-service stuff, lock the account, right? Try, try to log in with the credentials that have been exposed in the breach. If, if you actually can connect to your internal directory with those breach credentials, just immediate, immediately lock that account and terminate all active sessions. Don't know what anyone actually does this, but I'd love to see it. So once again, credential leaks plus Intel, less work for me. Right, and again, I'm a big fan of less work. So where we start getting some really interesting automation side of things is when you start talking about security operations. Um, so obviously we want to help enable those incident responders to be able to make fast, confident decisions. Right, reduce the amount of time you're, you're spending looking at indicators to what's going on. Um, now logs don't tell you everything. I think you know, we've kind of talked over this. Management tools are great. If you've got a seam in your environment, that's a really good first start. But it doesn't really help you, in most cases, distinguish good from bad. You need some intelligence to help you make that decision. So we'll look at, okay, how do we automate triage, right? The last thing you want to do when you come in to, into the office in the morning as an incident responder, you see 5,000 alerts, and you've got to go and investigate every single one of those and see what's important. So if you can start pulling indicators into your log platform and looking at things like, what are these IP addresses? What are these hashes? What are these domains? Depending on what the data you're filling in, you can then start saying, okay, I know this stuff is not important. This is just normal run-of-the-mill things. I could ignore 90% of these things. But this 10% that I'm left with, that's important. That's where I need to spend my time investigating. And then you can go a little bit further. So you can, well, this is what I'm saying, you can correlate your proxy logs against domains, firewall logs, IP addresses, input logs and hashes. It happens to be whatever you've got in the environment. Now, if you trust the fidelity of the indicators that you have, you can then start putting protective controls in place. You can tell your firewalls to block those IP addresses. You can block on proxies. You can block on endpoints. Whatever tool sets you've got, you can probably automate to some level if you've got a good enough intelligence feed going into there. Right? And then that helps reduce the workload on the responders. Right? Because once you've told your endpoint to block those hashes or block the, you know, whatever your environment is, if you can block URLs or IP addresses directly on the endpoint as well as on firewalls, that gives you a pretty comprehensive control set. You don't need to worry about that particular threat. You've just dealt with it automatically. That's really relevant for things like, you know, data exfil through command and control servers. If you can cut those command and control servers off, well, you, you, the data exfil can't happen. So, Stoxy's third rule of security, Intel, funnily enough, leads to less work. Um, third party risk is what something we're seeing is, is a big bad way at the moment. Um, 2021, I'm naming as year of the supply chain attack. Um, thank you to SolarWinds and Pulse and everyone else who is helping us with this. Um, obviously supply chain attacks are not new, but reached some pretty new levels of prominence this year. Now interestingly, the same data points that you would apply to your own organisation from a brand protection perspective, you really want to apply to your supply chain. Right, so you want to know, has your supply chain partners been impacted by, by a credential leak? Are we seeing them spoken about on, ransom, on ransomware sites? Are they getting mentioned on dark forums? Have they got misconfigured or out of date software running on internet facing devices? So all the same things you want to do to protect yourself, you want your partners and suppliers to be doing to protect them. Because if they have access to your environment and they can be compromised, then you of course can be compromised through them. Um, you know, the, the traditional whipping boy here is, of course, Target in the United States, but it's happened with many other companies as well. And we've seen recently some really high profile compromises of large managed services organisations in some parts of the world. Now, and the potential reach of that is huge. Um, and I've just spoken about a lot. So, again, we can automate that kind of information. Now, most, most um, organisations will have some form of vendor management tool set. So if you think, okay, that's great, um, I give them a questionnaire when we onboard them and they fill out the questionnaire and they tick a box, bunch of boxes that say, yes, we do all these compliance things, and they hand the questionnaire back and you say, great, you're now a supplier or you're now a partner, whatever it happens to be. And if you're particularly mature, you might ask them to repeat that survey every six months or every 12 months to see if anything's changed. And of course they haven't because everybody just ticks all the yes boxes because that's they want to do business with you. So if you can then feed into that management system a bunch of information around, you know, to, to cross-reference what they're telling you and make sure that it's actually accurate. And, you know, saying, that, yes, we have protections in place for X, Y, and Z, but you can go back and say, well, hang on, you've said you've got all these protections in place, but we've noticed you've got a 
deprecated version of jQuery running on your front end web servers that are publicly accessible to the internet and that version is linked to these CVEs and your web server can be compromised and if that can be compromised, what else can be compromised? Um, you know, explain that to me, Mr. Partner. I would like to understand my level of risk here. And you actually start having a real risk-based conversation in the, almost in real time, right? So as if, again, if you have a, a good source of intelligence that you trust, you can have those come up immediately with your vendor management team as, you know, he, here are the people you need to call today to get updates on their status. Don't be afraid to quiz them. And Stoxy's fourth rule of security intel, less work. And vulnerability is another area where we see um, a huge amount of opportunity for automation. Um, so the, the key here obviously is to stay ahead of the curve in terms of patching systems and that can be really hard. In large complex environments, which is pretty much everybody in the room is probably part of a, of a large complex environment, you know, how do you prioritize what gets replaced, what gets patched, what gets maintained, all the rest of it? It's incredibly hard to do that, particularly in environments where, like everyone, it's like, no, mission critical, you can't have any downtime. So hopefully you've got a really good and comprehensive configuration management database. Uh, we like this. So how about we start comparing that, right, and allow you to do some level of prioritization and triage. So, you know, now typically that involves using things like CVSS scores. Um, everybody talks to the National Vulnerability Database. You know, you'll, you've got a common identifier, which is great. But the problem with that is CVSS scoring can lag, right, sometimes by days or weeks. So you don't really have a data point around a particular vulnerability if that's what you're using to score. So if you can get information in there around a particular vulnerability, and that might be we're seeing it spoken about on the dark web, we're seeing it's been, you know, there's some, some penetration tools available, uh, penetration testing tools available, or most importantly, it's been exploited in the wild. Right, at that point, you've moved from a theoretical thing that somebody's talking about saying, oh, we've discovered this vulnerability in, in product X, to this vulnerability is being actively exploited and people are being compromised, right? You need, to, you need to patch that today. So by bringing in, you know, a good intelligence feed into your vulnerability management tools, again, you can re-triage, if you like, in real time as these things evolve. And, you know, be able to go to the business and say, yeah, look, that thing that's really critical to you, I do need to shut it down for 30 minutes because if I don't, the entire business will suffer. And look, here's the evidence why the entire business will suffer. So once again, a configuration management database plus intelligence is less work. Now there's a couple of things to really keep in mind here. Um, intelligence has to be timely, right? It's no good having the, the most detailed and accurate intelligence if it's delivered to you a week after the event, right? Particularly with things like vulnerability, that is absolutely no good to you. Uh, it's like, you know, someone coming to you and saying, oh yeah, this thing, this, this vulnerability, yeah, by the way, that was exploited in the wild a week ago, oh, and it was exploited in the wild at your place. So now you've got a massive issue to clear up. So very important, intelligence must be timely. I think that's fairly obvious. Intelligence also has to be time bound. And that's crucially important because indicators change over time. About the only thing that doesn't change over time is hashes. Right, so I mean, a malware hash today is a malware hash tomorrow, that's not going to change. But IP addresses change, domains change, the riskiness of this changes. If you look at a typical phishing campaign, for example, you will see that the host behind the web server is rotated sometimes on an, you know, on an hourly or 10 minutely basis as the bad actors try to get around various blocking tools. They'll constantly cycle that through. Um, tools um, like domain tools, for example, um, that can do passive DNS and track those changes over time can show you that very accurately. Uh, so there's a good intelligence source to bring in. Um, so simply seeing something on a list of indicators once and adding it to a block list is great like that. That gets you out of a hole today. But in a couple of months time, you're probably going to be blocking 90% of the internet. And that's probably not going to work from the business perspective. I guarantee you're going to be getting a lot of help desk calls over that. So having some way of aging that out and getting rid of old indicators and only keeping current ones, particularly when you're applying active controls, 
a uh, little bit less relevant when you're doing triage, but then again, your triage becomes less effective over time if those indicators are not kept up to date. You're gonna be looking at old data. So it's a really important point. Um, and we talk to people all the time and they kind of miss that step out. They've, they've got to the point of say, bringing in um, you know, a list of IPs from abuse.ch, which, you know, which is a great source, but don't have a mechanism for dropping the old indicators before they refresh that list. So that list just grows over time. So, which brings us to Stoxy's special rule of security intelligence to summarize all of this is data I have plus quality intelligence equals less work overall. And this really is the absolute key to it all, is finding a way to take the data that you have. Um, and again, pretty much everyone here will have that data in their environment in some form, hopefully nicely in a log management tool. Um, taking that data that you already have and then saying, all right, what exists in the world that I can use to enrich that data that is going to make my life easier and is going to expose and therefore allow me to reduce risk to my business. So it all makes sense, um, hopefully. Um, and I'll throw across and see if there's any questions at that point. I'm showing. Cool, that's gonna be the shortest 30 minute, 40 minute presentation on the planet. If you like that, we could have started even later. If anyone does have any questions, please do put them in through the app, okay? And then we'll see them and I, I can flag Richard and we can get them answered. Or if you can type in yell at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> or if you're having troubles getting a question actually lodged in the app, just come over and see me. Cool. So um, I guess, uh, a couple of general points that we'll throw in there is what what's great about the world of enterprise software and cloud-based software and everything today is a lot of tools are being developed API first. And this is a great thing because from the point of view of yourselves as security professionals, it, that is going to make it easier for you to adopt things like intelligence feeds, automation, whatever, all of these things become easier when you can make things talk to each other. If you cast your mind back, not even that long, um, and everyone was building their own proprietary tool sets, and they had their own, if they had an interface, it was something proprietary that you may or may not be able to get programmatic access to. Making things like SOAR work were next to impossible. Right, the hoops you had to jump through to get system A to talk to system B were sometimes absolutely insurmountable. Um, so I think one of the best things that positions us for success in the world today is the fact that many vendors, particularly particularly the newer ones, like the, the born in the cloud people, are designing their applications and their tool sets API, as an API driven thing. This, and you know, that is a fantastic outcome for everyone here because without that, things like SOAR, pretty much impossible. Things like data enrichment through intelligence feeds become very, very difficult. So we're in a really good position to make this work well. Um, I guess I'll leave with the closing thought that if, you, if you're doing any form of log management, if you've invested in log management tools, you know, a, a seam environment, it's not really seam without intelligence. It, it is just log storage. And I think that was a piece that got missed in a lot of, you know, not, it's not the fault of the seam vendors by any stretch. I think it's a project deployment piece that everyone just kind of overlooks, right? And people have, have gone down this path of wanting seam and ended up with a great log storage solution but it's not capable of identifying incidents or managing events. Um, so that taking that time to bring Intel into those platforms that you already have um, is probably going to save you hiring an extra four SOC analysts. Um, and if anyone's tried to hire SOC analysts recently, it probably has not been easy, like you just can't find them. Um, so you know, if you can stop needing that headcount and allow your people to actually do their jobs more effectively, more efficiently, the net result is a win for your business, lower risk, and everyone's gonna be happy and your analysts aren't gonna burn out and quit. If you've got time for a que question or two. Absolutely. Um, we've, we've got actually three up here now. So this one's been posted anonymously. <laughs> if you work at an org with a very average CMDB, what's the best way to approach vulnerability management and intelligence? Ooh, um, it's, it's a tricky one. You do need good foundational data or the intelligence you're applying is not going to be as useful 
to you. Um, and I'll just give you an example. Like, um, yeah, if, if you have a system that says we use Microsoft Windows, you're going to get a lot of alerts on that, as opposed to saying I have Windows, you know, Windows 10, whatever build number, where you can get very specific around these are the vulnerabilities that attach to that. So, I mean, that is, there is certain foundational work that you sometimes will need to do first to make these things more effective. That's not saying you can't get value out of it, it just may be noisier. Fair enough. I hope that answered the question, otherwise post a follow-up one and we'll get to it. Uh, what's the best way to start a TI program capability? Buying feeds, dedicating people, what's the way forward? It depends on what your outcome is. So, um, and if you look at it, I guess, from TRIA, uh, like your response levels, um, personally, I think starting, like if you have a SIEM product in place, for example, and you've got some SOC analysts that use that SIEM, a really good starting point is bring some threat feeds into the SIEM and start doing data correlation there. You're going to make your SOC analyst lives much easier and, you know, see dramatic reduction in that. If you are, you know, looking at something beyond that, if you want to make things easier for threat hunters um, to look at, you know, I have an indicator, I want more information on that. Um, slightly different approach, I mean, that's potentially more of a manual consumption thing and, and less hard to automate. Uh, but certainly, if you have a seam, start there. Start, do that low level thing and get those runs on the board there. Yep, fair enough. And uh, while you're talking about the manual interventions, there's another question here. Do you agree that intelligence requires human analysis and how does that fit into these models? Oh, really good question. And we can have a really good philosophical conversation. Who posted that? Is that someone in the room? Because we can have a really good philosophical conversation o over beers later today on that. Well, in fact, we can have a conversation over beers now. We're in <laughs> Queensland. <laughs> I was um, going to say, that's where you miss out on the virtual stream is actually drinking beer and having the philosophical... Yeah, people on the stream, sorry, but yep. crack one, have it. Um, yes and no. Um, it depends on what it is to some extent. Um, human oversight, I think, is always going to be necessary at some level, but being able to... I mean, the, the problem is scale, right? Human oversight doesn't scale, so you need some level of confidence in automatically derived indicators. Um, however, that is done on the back end to provide those to you. That's why I say that being able to assess the quality of an intelligence feed, um, and that could be verifying it against some other ones. If, you, if you're looking at buying something, do some comparisons and, and see which one is providing you more better analysis and better context. Um, yeah, it, it really is a question of scale, and it depends on what it is too. So. Um, there's, there's absolutely a requirement for human-based intelligence, human-based analysis of intelligence. Um, you know, we, we have a research team with people all over the world and that's what they do. They are the, the human analysts um, and they are way smarter than I am and they have very specific areas of expertise. You know, you'll have fin crime people and you'll have geopolitical people and what have you and they, they have their areas of speciality and they're the people that write you the, the fantastic reports on whatever the area of speciality is. Absolutely, there is a requirement for that. But the problem with relying solely on that is you run into that data aging problem. Like by the time those finished intelligence reports get to you, it's probably too late um, for you to do anything programmatic about it. You know, if you're waiting for human analysis on a piece of malware, you've already been infected by that piece of malware by the time you get the analysis. Um, so I think the two are very, very important, but a trust, you know, having a source of machine-driven intelligence that you can trust even if it's not, you know, even if you don't trust it to the level of saying, I'm going to take this list of IP addresses and tell my firewall to block them all. That's a pretty high level of confidence you need to, to assign that level of trust to a, to a list you get from somewhere. But you probably trust it enough to say, I'm going to use that to flag incidents in my scene. And that's my starting point for that. So good question. But yeah, let's have a drink later and talk about that. Ooh. We done? Well, that's it that on the questions for now, um, but carry on if there's any other bits and pieces or... Um, no, I could do an interpretive dance, but my dance yeah. skills are terrible. Oh, no, I, I, I have got my special rule of intelligence out. I will say thank you all for attending. Yeah. Anyone got any further questions? Otherwise, nope. Thank you very much, Richard. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Juggling a lot of stuff here. Okay, we'll take a few minutes break and then we'll come back for the next talk. I think it's 11.40.